Good morning, everybody. So, dear guests, dear BCCP fellows, um, a very warm welcome uh, here at the third BCCP conference on regulatory challenges in digital markets, Trust Online. For the first, third year in a row, we decided to dedicate our uh, big event uh, to um, issues related to digitization uh, that is uh, dominating the public discussion, the policy discussion, uh, with this uh, incredible transformative potential, uh, the great benefits that it brings, but also um, big unresolved challenges. Uh, this year we chose uh, to talk about trust online and it's clear that trust is uh, a key element of the working of digital markets. Um, but uh, actually little we know, uh, did we know that uh, the, the topic of trust uh, would have become so central exactly this year. Um, so the Cambridge Analytica and Facebook um, data scandal uh, really created an even more intense discussion about this issue. So how much can consumer trust uh, online platforms uh, that have a lot of information about themselves? And, uh, and this is not only in the general discussion. So this case also triggers some uh, formal investigations um, into the uh, illicit, illicit harvesting of personal information. Um, the implementation of the uh, European General Data Protection Regulation just a few weeks ago, so I'm sure uh, most of you got tons of emails. Uh, um, so it's also making really clear how uh, timely the issue of uh, um, data pr protection, uh, personal data sharing and trust online is. Yet uh, trust online is not only that, it's, uh, it's more. Um, so consumers are not only required to uh, share some of the highly personal data to use some goods and services and often without really uh, being fully aware of what they share, uh, but they also need to process large amounts of information that uh, are, are often very difficult to verify. Uh, so to ensure the reliability of the information in these digital markets uh, and also uh, the safety of the data that consumers uh, provide to platform, uh, it's very important to have a very well-designed legal and regulatory framework and also very active enforcement. Um, so more fundamentally, consumer, uh, consumers have to trust uh, all players in digital markets from the providers of the good to the platforms to the other people they uh, interact uh, online. Um, and then the question arises, so how do we reach this level of trust? Uh, and review and recommendation systems are one uh, uh, example. Uh, and they have been designed to establish and facilitate trust uh, in uh, commercial uh, transaction. Um, on the policy side, we have this uh, regulation, so privacy and data protection regulation, that should strengthen uh, the faith of consumer that they are safe. They can do this transaction. They can share their data uh, online. So, and this is exactly what we want to uh, address during this conference. Um, so, this question of the interplay between consumer information and uh, and trust online. Um, so, we will ask a different question in the three session uh, with different set of uh, panelists. Um, so in the first session, we will uh, go more on the policy side and, and look at so um, what is the role of consumer trust uh, in, uh, for the success of a very uh, ambitious uh, project, which is the digital single market, and how much uh, actually the new European General Data Protection Regulation can help to reach this goal. 
uh, then we will look at so what are rule and mechanisms that can effectively facilitate consumer trust, uh, and also how can online marketplace be designed to allow both firms and uh, consumer to benefit from this enormous potential of digital markets. So I think that uh, I was asked before, I think this conference is the best example of what the Berlin Center for Consumer Policy uh, aims to be. Uh, we want to be a platform where a diverse um, um, group of the smart, uh, smartest and uh, most uh, distinguished expert academics, policy makers uh, come together talk about issues that are really relevant for today's society so that we have this transfer between what we know from our research and what is relevant for, for policy. Uh, and it's not a coincidence that we chose to, to do this conference here. So here is the Leibniz Association. The Leibniz Association is our main um, general sponsor. They supported the birth of BCCP, and we truly hope that they will support the continuation of BCCP for the next four years. Um, so it's a pleasure for us, but also our liability to be here and to show uh, this association uh, how relevant and topical the issues on our research agenda are, and also uh, the extreme, extraordinary quality of the discussions that uh, BCCP is trying to um, to move. So uh, before I, I conclude, so uh, it's more remarks, so we are streamlining, uh, um, we are streaming the, uh, the conference online, so it's, uh, uh, it's a duty if you do a conference on digitization, uh, I think so, but maybe somebody of you doesn't want to be uh, stream online, uh, stream or um, film. So if you don't want, then please sit on the back. The, the cameras are looking uh, uh, to the front. And, uh, and then I use uh, my spot now to thank the people who really uh, made this event possible, first of all, Hannes. Uh, so the, the guests uh, got many emails, so Hannes never gave up. Uh, if somebody said, oh, we, we don't know if we can make. So he was really uh, making this possible. And clearly the, the fantastic team, uh, so there are many people, some are sitting on the back there doing the Twitter, some are outside, uh, they prepare the booklet, the brochure, they organize the buffet, and all these things are also very important for the success of the conference. So thank you very, very much uh, to the entire team. And now it's time to start, so again, uh, a warm welcome. Uh, we hope you will enjoy this uh, uh, exceptional event for us. And um, so have fun today. So good morning, um, and, and thanks for coming. So my name is Ludwig Ziegler. I work for The Economist. I'm uh, the tech scribe for The Economist, and um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. It's, it's, it's great. The, the thing is, at The Economist, we, we've written a lot about antitrust recently, and uh, I went to an antitrust conference in, uh, in Chicago uh, a month ago, and also organized by an Italian. That seems to be the thing these days. Um, and, uh, but what, what was interesting is that uh, a, a lot of the discussions wasn't about antitrust, it was about trust. It was about consumer protection. Uh, uh, and the argument was, I mean, antitrust can only do so much, but if we talk about addiction, if we talk about uh, of social media, these type of things, uh, manipulation, we need a different tool set. And so uh, this is actually a good follow-up conference. Um, and we have a great panel. We have Stacey Feuer from the FTC. Um, you do international consumer protection there for some time. Already uh, we have Johan Lepassar, uh, who works for uh, Andres Ansip um, of the commission. And you were kind of, you were shepherding through the digital single market there. I'm still doing it, yeah. You're still doing it, yeah. It's not, not over. <laughs> and so we'll discuss that. I'm, I'm a very um, uh, uh, 
light touch moderator. So if, if you want to interrupt, if you have a question, raise your hand. And uh, there's also one rule after we talk here up front is that the first three questions have to be asked by women. Um, it's not quite a manal, it's not quite a man panel here, uh, but I think that that's a very good rule. So though we start with uh, the male member of the panel, um, because it, it, it works better. So, uh, Juan, could, could, could you briefly tell us what, what you do at the commission and, and, and kind of your role mm -hmm. uh, in, in designing uh, the digital single market and also kind of walk us through what you've done kind of and, and like through the lenses of, of, of trust and, and, and yeah. Thank you. Um, pleasure to be here in Berlin. Uh, it's summer here. It's uh, uh, perpetual autumn spring in Brussels. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, it's very unfortunate that we can't be uh, outside. Um, however, um, I think we can all see how nice it is. Um, what is the digital single market? Perhaps I mean very, very briefly about that, because that is my main role in order to help this big agenda to be materialized and reached by the end of the term of this commission, which is the 1st of November 2019. Not so far away anymore. Um, well, our main aim is to reduce the fragmentation of European single market and digital space. And mainly it's for the benefit of the consumers. Because if you, if you look all these compartmentalized digital markets, what they, what they, in effect, what they result to is that the prices for the consumers are higher, the competition is, well, it, it, it does exist, but uh, not as at the level that it should be, which means that the kind of innovative services and opportunities uh, do not exist either. Um, for us, the main gist of it is uh, operating through three themes, and we proposed altogether 29 legislative proposals, out of which 16 has already been agreed, so uh, we're getting there. But the main three themes that we are keeping in mind is, first of all, the e-commerce market, the free movement of goods and services in digital space, so that the consumers can access these digital goods or digital services cross-border, <coughs> online, without any hassle. They can shop as easily in Berlin or in the German digital space uh, as well as in other member states. So that is the first angle or theme, and we've adopted already quite many legislative pieces in order to ease the consumer's um, uh, experience in the single market. One of them is the job locking or end of the job locking uh, regulation that will kick in in December. It's the portability so that you can, if you travel or you have a holiday in other member states, you can port your subscription uh, from Netflix from one place to another, et cetera, et cetera. There is no roaming. I've, I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, the second theme is very much about uh, how the underlying infrastructure of the digital single market or the digital space. So it's the connectivity, but it's also about ensuring privacy and making sure that the ecosystem is cyber secure. And that I, that I think is something that I would like to explore perhaps further in this panel as well. And the third theme is more about uh, the, uh, the, the space around the digital ecosystem, which is about the people's skills, how the society operates, whether the society is digitally capable of actually enabling these uh, big effects to, to be re reaped. Uh, so we look at the e-government, uh, how to make sure that uh, if European member states built up their e-government capacities, that these capacities are compatible with other capacities in other member states. So if I go and work in another member state, I, I can do digitally all the necessary paperwork that is needed for me to, to smoothly integrate myself to this new society where I live. So. This is, in essence, what the digital single market is all about. Now, a few words about this trust. Uh, I've not been in this business as long as Tracy has been, but I think one thing that struck me in the beginning when we started with the digital single market approach is that what it was a stark contrast between uh, what the consumer perception was perceived to be 
in the two sides of the Atlantic. And I think it, it, the best uh, sentence that I've heard that illustrates this is that I've heard in one interlocutor who spoke, well, in the United States we do innovation, in Europe you do GDPR. Uh, and I think for a long time that was a kind of a very binary approach. That in the US, you know, we do all this nice stuff, whereas you look how to essentially set limits and, uh, and, and shrink the space of innovation. I don't think that it is actually true. Uh, and I think the recent debates around uh, what some of the platforms have done with our data or how they've allowed access to third parties to private data uh, without the consent of the user. That essentially shows that the issues around privacy is something that is not only a, a European issue, it's also uh, an American issue. And vice versa when we talk about innovation, it's not something that only happens in Silicon Valley. There are more startups per capita in Europe than there are in the United States. Uh, and I think there are a lot of innovation that goes on in Europe, and part of the reason why it doesn't stay here is precisely this fragmentation of the just single market. Uh, because if you don't have a nice, more or less common market where you can sell your goods and services, you will look at other home bases which help you to grow and then become global because that is the, uh, in the end of the day, that is the aim of all the startups. Um, so yeah, I mean, I can go on and on about the, uh, uh, about the, the trust issue, but I think uh, as an introduction, that would be... <coughs> we'll we'll, we'll be get to that. Just tell me kind of what's still in the pipeline and... Um are you going to kind of elongate the pipeline? Is there, is there more to come? No, there isn't more to come because I think in the end of, well, we are in the, in the final quarter of the, of the mandate of this commission. I think in the end of the day, what we want to see is to not only to make sure that all the legislative proposals are agreed so that actually change will happen on the ground, but we also want to make sure that this change is implemented and enforced. So, for example, on the geo-blocking that kicks in only on December, we are already working now in order to make sure that all stakeholders, the retailers, the consumer organizations, parcel and payment delivery service providers, that they know what they should do, what is allowed, what is not allowed, what kind of liabilities occur or do not occur, uh, what kind of monitoring system is in place so, so that if they have any questions or issues that they can proactively engage with authorities and, and seek to, to solve them. So we don't see much in the pipeline. I mean, there is also a, an issue that the world does not stand still and obviously everything moves forward and policy making is a kind of a continuous cycle. But there isn't, kind of, I think, what we see in terms of the strategy that uh, we designed in was it May 2015, We've delivered all the necessary actions, and now it's really our job to make sure that uh, these uh, these will be implemented and enforced on the ground as well. Now, Brussels, of course, is a place where I mean, it's it's um, difficult to get things done. But I mean, could you could you? Is it? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> I'd like, I'd like, I'm surprised how it's easy actually. Wrong way, actually of, is. <laughs> wrong way of putting yeah. it. But I mean, you you have to cut compromises, yeah. deals, all that. So, is it, is there anything you think should have been done which hasn't been done? Um, I don't think that it's a, it's a place where it's difficult to get things done. Uh, I think it's difficult to get through one, only one set of vision. Uh, and perhaps it's for the good, uh, that you don't have single-minded, uh, one-goal uh, issues. You, you, they tend to be evened out during the negotiation process. So one could argue that perhaps we could have been more bold on this or that, Etc. Um, but I think overall, uh, what we see is uh, well, the benefits of the digital single market are not yet there. They are gradually kicking in. So there's no, for the consumer side, there's no roaming, there's portability, the end of geo blocking will come. Uh, we just uh, had an agreement between the Parliament and Council on the new telecom code, which essentially would enable the telcos to roll out more investments so that the consumer can re reap the benefits of the 5G sooner. 
run later. But I mean, this is again something that will kick in only in a few years' time. Um, so one issue that remains a problem is that European level re regulation or legislation is slower than national legislation in terms of how it kicks in. But uh, if you look at the legislative agenda as well, there are more regulations than directives. Uh, so we, we've tried to be swifter, especially when it goes to consumer side. So uh, all the, all the consumer-centric measures uh, are done via regulations, via the market uh, framework measures are more directives. Cool, thank you very much. Stacy. you're kind of in charge of the American digital single market. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, that's a tall order. Um, well, maybe I'll pick up sort of where Johannes started. And um, before I do, let me just explain who I am and what the FTC is. So for those of you who don't know, the FTC, the US Federal Trade Commission, is an independent federal agency that has responsibility for enforcing a wide range of consumer competition and privacy laws across the United States, and we have jurisdiction in most but not all parts of the economy. Um, and I work in the FTC's Office of International Affairs where I focus on international consumer protection and privacy issues. Um, and so this is a good moment for me to say what we're always required to say, which is that these are my views and they don't <laughs> represent those of the commission or any individual commissioner. Um, so that being said, I, I think it's interesting when we think about consumer trust, and it presents lots of challenges. Obviously, challenges for policymakers like Johannes and DG Connect and all the European Commission directorates, which are trying to um, develop and grow the single digital market. It presents challenges for businesses who are trying to roll out new products and convince all of us to accept things like um, smart refrigerators, smart watches, and smart cars. I, I do want a smart car, I'm just, you know, a little scared, but I would like not to have to drive. Um, and of course, it um, presents challenges for enforcers, like at my agency, where we are trying to implement and enforce a wide variety of truth in advertising, privacy, and other laws and principles. So um, I thought I would start by stepping back and talking about th the question I think that almost never really gets answered, which is what is consumer trust? What are the drivers? What are, what are we talking about when we talk about consumer trust? And um, then give some examples of, of how I see it playing out um, through, through the vantage point of my work at the FTC. So um, consumer trust is often talked about as if it's something that is one-dimensional, something that is fixed, freestanding, and permanent. And I, I think it's trickier than that. Um, consumer trust is multi-dimensional. Consumer trust is relational, consumer trust is experiential, and consumer trust is variable. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, on the sort of idea of multidimensional, there are all the traditional indicia of consumer trust. So, you know, there is the usual sort of price and value and convenience, but there are things like quality, customer service, and even, I would dare say, things like risk tolerance. Um, but then, of course, there are whole areas in the digital economy that are new. How a company treats consumer data is something that was somewhat relevant beforehand, but now is top of mind, obviously. So talking about these different factors, relational, when I say relational, I mean, what are you comparing consumer trust in the digital economy to? So are you comparing it to conventional markets and traditional alternatives? And I do a lot of work um, in the Consumer Policy Committee at the OECD, and they did a fascinating study last year on consumer trust in what they call peer platform marketplaces, what the rest of us call the sharing economy or the collaborative economy. And interestingly, one out of three consumers trusted the specific platform that they were asked about more than conventional businesses in the same market. And 
it was really striking. This was a study of, uh, I think, a thousand consumers each in 10 countries. And in some countries, and, and Germany was one where consumers had more trust in conventional businesses, so maybe Germany's doing something right there. But in countries like Mexico and Turkey, for example, consumers trusted ride-sharing companies like Uber far more than they tr trusted their traditional alternatives, the taxi cabs. So relational, what are you comparing things to? Experiential, th this is context. What are the consumers' priors? What are the consumers' um, direct experiences themselves personally and within their household, among their peers? And then variable, and variability is, I I'm thinking of a concept that relates not to just how consumer attitudes change over time, but to variables like age, right, where you really get very, very different um, answers to questions about trust when you look at millennial consumers and when you look at consumers like me who are over 50. Um, my daughter and my son, my kids who are teenagers, and my husband and I have a great disconnect in our household or, over what we should actually trust. So I want to give three examples, and you'll stop me if I'm going on way too long, um, of how this plays out. Um, and the three examples are social media marketing, particularly influencer marketing, which is an area the FTC has done a lot of work on. Second is the area of payment protections and payment security. And then third, of course, privacy, which with the GDPR coming into force is top of mind for all of us. So. Um, one example of the complexity of consumer trust issues is social media marketing. As consumers have lost trust in governments, businesses, the media, all sorts of large institutions, they more and more turn to their peers for, for opinions, for reviews. And we see that in the large number of consumers who do rely on online reviews to get information. We also see it in this phenomenon of influencer marketing where consumers, and, and I have to say this actually feels really strange to me, um, they rely on influencers who they find to be more authentic, with whom they feel that they have a virtual personal connection, right? Even though they don't know them. They only know them through their online curated presence. So, um, it, 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 that, that's a really in interesting phenomenon, but how does that relate to s sort of the thesis about trust? Well, um, on the relational point, um, you know, it, it's interesting because what are they comparing this to? Well, they're comparing their trusted influencers to the kinds of direct media marketing messages that they've gotten all along and they've decided lack credibility for whatever reason. They're also interestingly comparing it to typical endorser advertising, so celebrity advertising, right? They trust influencers more than they trust celebrities who are hawking a product, and why is that? It's because they perceive that the celebrity is getting paid for his or her endorsement, but they think that the influencer isn't. And that is sort of where, um, where we find that very interesting because, of course, um, most influencers are, in fact, being compensated in some way, either monetarily or through in-kind products and trips and vacations. So uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then uh, also just to highlight the variable, um, uh, the variable aspect here, one of the things when you look at consumer trusted influencer advertising is this, is this phenomenon I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, which is consumers who are under, I think, the age of 25 have a huge amount of trust in influencers, and consumers who are older are more skeptical. Now, the rub in all of this and where I think the policy solutions come in, and, and certainly for us the enforcement solutions, is really in traditional consumer protection laws. One, one thing that's emerging, and the studies are starting to show based on reports about some followers maybe not really having as many followers as they purport to have, about people buying bots to serve as followers, is that consumers are starting to understand that maybe influencing influencer marketing is not as um, 
authentic as, as they, they believe. And according to a review of the evidence that was in eMarketer a few months ago, that while there's some evidence that disclosure of, a cons of an influencer's uh, commercial relationship with a brand will lower um, some consumer interactions, at least initially, at the end of the day, consumers really do appreciate transparency and honesty from marketers and influencers. So here, what we would say at the FTC is that this is really no different than the truth in advertising laws and our endorsement guides, which have always required the disclosure of um, material connections between an endorser and a brand. And the actual language, um, and I may even have to put on my glasses to quote this here, even though I used to litigate these cases, um, is that you have to disclose any connections that materially affect the weight or credibility of the information provided if the connection is not reasonably expected by the consumer. And so I think that's a really um, interesting to point to think about when we talk about consumer trust, and I'll talk about this in the privacy area as well, is reasonable expectations. What consumers expect out of the world really influences what they ultimately, what the trust equation ultimately is for them. And um, so my agency has done a lot of work. We've sued some big endorsers, um, notably, and I never say this right, PewDiePie, who has, is a gaming influencer based in Sweden. We didn't sue him, we sued Warner Brothers, who is the company, a big motion picture studio uh, that was compensating him um, for failing to disclose all of his connections from the company in connection with his many, many blog posts, YouTube videos, tweets about Shadow of Mortar, which I guess is a game. I know it's a game, but um, I've never played it. Um, but we, we have sent warning letters to many, many Instagram influencers. We uh, have a lot of do's and don'ts that we provide to influencers themselves. So that's, that's just one area of social can, can media Can I marketing. interrupt you there? Can, I mean, I think it's always interesting in the US. So in, in, you said it's kind of uh, Brussels kind of legislate, it's generally it's legislation, kind of that's, that's how you set the rules. Seems to me in, in your case, kind of the, the influences that came about because you saw the problem. Can, I, can, can, can you tell us how that worked? Kind of how did you decide to kind of focus on that, that area and, 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 and come up with some enforcement rules? I mean, it's, there was no law on influences. Right, well, there is a law, and yeah. the law is the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair, deceptive acts or practices in commerce. Yeah. Now, yeah. it's a very flexible law, but we do actually also have what I would call secondary laws, so these are regulations, and we have something called the endorsement guidelines, and they, they are, uh, um, they're published in our federal register, which is sort of like the official journal. So they are, um, they don't have quite the force of law, but they are, they are, they are, um, they are binding. And um, so we've always had these endorsement guidelines. And in 2009, we reviewed them in light of all of the changes to the that we were seeing in markets. And from 2009 onwards, we started seeing things emerging in the marketplace. Um, like, you know, Pinterest pin sponsored contests. Obviously, bloggers, um, when we did the endorsement guidelines, were a big issue. We were seeing a lot of people writing blogs about products, but not disclosing that they were being paid for them, for or that the products were being provided to them free of charge. And um, we just essentially took our, and the United States has a common law legal system, we took those principles that we'd always had in our truth in advertising cases, and we started applying them to these new areas. Now, um, many people often criticize the United States for not having clear standards. We actually do have them in this area, and what we've, what we've done is we've updated almost on a yearly basis um, a series of FAQs, these are not binding law, but we actually go into extreme detail about how to make disclosures online, how to make disclosures in your Pinterest pictures, um, you know, whether you need to use text, whether you need to use overlays. We've talked about uh, a, a number of these factors. And I, 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 it, this is not legislative, this is an application 
of a long-standing truth and advertising principle to a new market. It's an area where I, I guess social media influencer marketing is not something where we think we need a new law that we don't want to say. And I, I know that actually that the new um, EU proposal uh, on a new deal for consumers actually would make it a per se violation of the Am unfair commercial practices directive yes. um, not to disclose a material connection. Uh, for us, I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting proposal and it really matches very nicely with um, what we've done at the FTC. For us, we don't necessarily need a law to make it a, a sort of a blacklisted practice. And if you get back to the idea of reasonable connections, there are examples, and we have them on the FTC's website, where we don't think you need to make a disclosure, as in the case of certain celebrity endorsements. So when Oprah Winfrey is doing a commercial for Weight Watchers, we think that consumers understand that she's being paid for that. That's not just because she loves the system so much. So the way that this really evolved is just as an application of a long-standing principle okay. and not as a legislative proposal. Hmm. I know you have two more examples, but kind of let's weave these in okay. later. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let, me, let me just touch very briefly on them then because um, I, I often get carried away by uh, social media marketing because I, I, I find it fascinating. Um, my other two examples really are payment protections, and that's an area where... Um, to, to talk about it very briefly, um, there are whole lots of new products out there because of new fin financial technologies, fintech, because of consumers' reliance on their mobile. Yet, in the United States at least, consumers have been relatively slow to adopt new payment mechanisms. Now, that's starting to change, and one of the questions is why. And here I was going to talk about the experiential factor, which is in 2016, our Commerce Department did a study looking at um, what essentially consumer trust online. And what was really interesting is that the biggest threat to consumer trust that they, that they pinpointed was actually a negative personal experience, a negative personal experience with an online breach of their credit card information, uh, identity theft, or some other type of malicious uh, activity online. And so uh, and we can talk more about payments later, but so one of, going back to the consumer trust is relational, experiential, and variable. The experiential seems to weigh very heavily in terms of what consumers will trust in, in, in payments. Um, and, and I'll talk about the, the sort of policy and enforcement response later if, if there's time. And then I do want to get to privacy. Um, so... Um, Obviously, with the GDPR now in effect and the uh, recent revelations about Facebook, which my agency is investigating, um, we usually don't disclose um, the existence of our investigations, but we do have an order against Facebook from several years ago. And so we did announce, given, given really the incredible public interest um, in this area, that we are investigating them. Um, but there are a lot of there's obviously a lot of uh, trust in online privacy, yet it's very difficult, I think, to somehow, sometimes, get a handle on the exact relationship between privacy and consumer trust. So many surveys show that consumers are very concerned about their privacy online, yet they often act in inconsistent ways. They reveal extremely personal information for very little in the way of monetary incentives. Um, Often they reveal personal information just to draw the attention of a peer online. Now many people have called this inconsistency the privacy paradox. But there are some um, studies emerging that are showing that maybe there's not as much of an inconsistency as we think. And what I, um, and, and we'll hear later from a colleague from, from the Harvard Business School, but I, there was a very interesting survey earlier this year that, um, essentially looked at how consumers' norms about their privacy offline correspond to their behavior online. And the bottom line of the study is it showed that when their information was being shared in a way that they expect, they were okay with it, so first-party marketing. But when their information was being collected and shared about them in a way that they did not understand 
or wouldn't trust in the offline context. So if you told something to a friend in confidence and you didn't know that the friend was going to go tell it to somebody else, consumers didn't trust that. And so it, to me, it really showed that when businesses use their data in hidden, unexpected, and undisclosed ways, consumers lose trust in the digital market. And that's, that's the thread there. And I can talk about how that relates to the FTC's approach to privacy, but I'll stop here given that I've been talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. I mean, uh, let, let, let me take a step back and, and, and be a bit contrarian. So we had Cambridge Analytica, we had that pro Cambridge Analytica, and we had that problem. So consumers realize there's a problem, they have to be more careful. And so Facebook will adapt. Um, it has already adapted, has changed its privacy policies, no longer gives uh, apps that, that type of access they had. So what's the problem? I mean, it, it's, it's a self-regulating system. And I mean, I mean, I'm putting my Silicon Valley hat on here, but isn't, isn't, aren't things working the way they're supposed to work? Why do we need um, uh, the many regulations of the digital single market? I understand the harmonization aspect, that, that is fine, but it, it seems to me it's a new medium. 20 years, I mean, of Facebook, 2007, it, it, it went mainstream. Uh, it'll, it'll solve itself. And actually, we don't know whether Facebook will be a, that important in five or, or 10 years. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that there's some validity to that argument. Um, certainly, we've seen many industries develop and change and mature over time. I, I, I would say from our perspective, though, one of the things about privacy and one of the things about data is that a lot of what goes on is hidden to the consumer. So, for example, the FTC did a report, well, we've done a lot of reports, but we did a report on data brokers, we did a report on cross-device tracking, trying to get a handle on what's going on. And a lot of what happens is not transparent to the consumer. So if it's not transparent to the consumer, then it's going to be very, very hard for the market either to self-correct or for there to be the impetus for robust self-regulation by companies. Now, I'm not saying that self-regulation is bad. I think, in fact, it is part of the toolkit for protecting consumers, together with good laws and good enforcement. But um, there aren't going to be the incentives if we just say um, to allow the, the markets to self-correct in that way because there's just too much that is hidden and out of the public eye. And given the growing appetite for consumer data with machine learning and all sorts of AI applications coming in, I think the pressures on businesses are going to be so high that they're not necessarily, and I think we've seen this in Facebook and with other uh, digital actors, to make them stop and assess what is going on um, and try and figure out if they're acting in accordance with existing norms and consumers' reasonable expectations. So there's a room for, I think, a lot of different approaches, but doing nothing is probably, at least from a personal perspective, not one I would endorse. Just a comment on this. I think it was a very useful uh, overview of the, of the different, uh, let's say, uh, high fly or key issues that are out there. And I think one of the major commonalities which I see on, the, on both sides of the transatlantic is how to ensure that the market, the digital market in particular, operates in a transparent way, and also how to avoid lock-ins, I think. And the, and, the, and the two approaches might be different. I think the, the US has taken more of an enforcement approach, partly because they have the uh, ability to do so because they have a federal agency like the FTC. We don't have a federal agencies in, the, in, in Europe, so we need to have EU-level laws so that the national enforcement agencies actually do follow the same practices. I think that's also the reason why we, they litigate, we regulate. Um, but I wanted to get into this issue of uh, avoiding lock-ins and, and, uh, and transparency. And I was intrigued by the question of whether Facebook, Facebook would disappear or not. One of the major emerging issues which I see in the digital marketplace is authentication. How 
does the consumer authenticate herself or himself vis-a-vis -vis different service providers. In a normal offline system where you really need to prove that you are a person, you, you take out your national ID card or your driving license or something like this and, you, and then the service provider says, payment service for example, that, okay, you're a real person. More and more often what we see in the digital space is that there are two global authenticators. It's Google and Facebook. Nothing really else. Um, is that a problem? I don't know. Will that become a problem? I don't know. But what I see is that it might create a lock-in situation. And also vis-a-vis -vis the national identities and national e-identities that we have already in Europe. We have a regulation that actually kicks in in September, which is called the EIDAS, which concerns the mutual recognition of national digital identities. So that if I use my Estonian digital identity and sign something, the Portuguese system knows that this signature is valid, that this person is authenticated. Now, I can't use that vis-a-vis -vis private service providers. That's very curious. Huh? Uh, I mean, I can show my password to the private service providers, but I can't use that, my national digital identity vis-a-vis -vis private service providers. I wonder why is that? Partly because authentication is a big business. But I don't know that consumers actually regard Facebook as an authenticator. They regard Facebook as a social media platform where they can connect with friends and Facebook reminds them the birth dates of their friends. I mean, that's the main uh, thing. Um, but in fact, the big business behind it is, is the authentication, and that is also a road where some of these authenticators gather consumer data, and they use it because they are the middlemen. Um, now, should we do something about it? How to make sure that first the consumer realize that, that, ah, they do this stuff. That means that they also retain some of the data. Even if I don't use Facebook services, but I authenticate, myself via Facebook, and I use a totally different platform in order to find these services, some of my consumer data is retained in Facebook. Do they know that? Do they acknowledge it? Um, that's the first problem. The second issue for me is really the issue of, you know, how to make sure that we don't create lock-ins, so that if we have other authentication means, that there is, there is a kind of a federated system of uh, authenticators that cross-use this, that I don't need to just use one or two, but I have multiple options as a consumer in order to go and, and seek out services. And I think that is a, a, a important question, not only vis-a-vis -vis, you know, how to make sure that in the digital world everybody knows I'm a real person, but it's also an issue of how to avoid lock-ins, how to, how to make sure that uh, my data is used in a transparent way, but also, in the end of the day, I think it's also this issue of the, you know, if, if you have followers. I mean, how many of these followers are real and how many of these are bots? I mean, I don't know. I mean, my Facebook has around 1,000 followers and my Twitter account as well. I have no idea who is, who is the real person, except if I go through them one by one. But the platform actually has means of making a distinction. And I wonder why they... Do, why they why don't they do that? That they say, well, in our own rules, we think that th this number is actually authenticated followers, and the others, we are not so certain. Um, I think it would be also a good measure of transparency, and that is something in the hands of industry. I mean, they could do that, but they don't do that. On, on the authentication, I remember in one of the uh, commission's uh, communications, I think it was on data flow, you mentioned, um, at least as, 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 a, as something to think about, is to mandate um, the use of, let's say, government-sponsored or, or, let's say, uh, authentication mechanisms on, on websites. Kind of that, that the idea is, so there's e-residency program in or kind of mm -hmm. what Estonia does, that if you offer, if you have a website, you have to offer kind of an alternative logon or login uh, or identity. Has that led to anything or is, is that still being discussed? Well, I mentioned the EIDAS regulation that yeah. kicks in finally yeah. uh, in September this year. I think it's 29th of September. Uh, but that is obligatory for uh, public administrations. So for public service providers, uh, they need to uh, acknowledge the uh, this 
the certified level of identity or e identities of other member states. Uh, um, it's not obligatory for private service providers to do so. It's voluntary, but of course, a in two years' time after the kick-in of this regulation, there will be a review. And I mean, that will be one of the major questions, whether to expand the scope of the EIDAS regulation to private service providers as well. So if I could just jump in. Um, I, I'm old enough to remember that when the internet first started, you know, the big thing was, the great thing about the internet was that no one would know if you were a dog, right? Like, and, um, so, it, you know, it's interesting because I think times have changed and while there are certainly still many good reasons for people to have anonymity online, right, I'm thinking about political speech and, 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 and things like that, um, it is interesting that this issue of authentication is, is coming up. Um, and it, it definitely relates to many consumer and privacy issues. Um, but like everything, and and you know, there have been policy discussions and many discussions about authentication over the years and I sort of never really thought about the platforms as authenticators. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 guess, I guess thinking about it for the, for the first time, you know, is that, is that, do we need better solutions? I mean, do we really want to have the platforms essentially performing this very important authentication rule, is that ceding too much power? Is it creating lock-in issues? And, and when you start talking about lock-in, I know one of the discussions about the GDPR coming in, right, is whether it in fact is going to um, increase the, um, the lock-in effects for some of the big tech companies which can comply and have already built, um, you know, Thinking about, for example, Google, which already had its Google takeout tool before GDPR and then just ramped it up in time for GDPR. And smaller companies that deal with data maybe don't have the same ability to comply with GDPR. So the lock-in and authentication issues um, to me are, are particularly interesting. But they're not necessarily consumer-facing issues. And I think one of the things that we see at the FTC getting back to consumer trust is um, consumers really base their trust on things that they can perceive, that they can touch, that they can see. And so there is a challenge um, without making it too complicated because one thing consumers don't have a lot of time is, is a lot of time for is time. Um, is how do you take some of these very complicated issues that we think about that play into the trust equation and, and communicate to con them to consumers in a way that consumers can understand and therefore make informed decisions. So these, these issues are really complicated and um, you know, thinking about, again, GDPR coming into effect, um, those companies that have relationships with consumers are going to be able for the most part, to be able to get consent. Um, yet there are lots of companies, and you know whether this is good or bad, we'll see, um, who don't have that relationship with the consumer and are going to find it a lot more difficult, again, for good or for worse. So going back to, to sort of the factors that I started out with, consumer trust being relational, experiential, and variable, on the experiential factor, um, that's where I see a lot of the policy discussions maybe not matching up with what consumers are actually experiencing in the moment. I mean, since, since you um, mentioned GDPR, I mean, uh, remember when GDPR was passed two years ago, uh, 2016 or something, I mean, in, in the US it was seen as kind of yeah, yet another kind of bureaucratic night nightmare coming, coming from Brussels. Uh, it seems to me that has changed even in the US. Is, is that correct? I mean, give, give us an idea how people think about the GDPR at this point. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's hard to know what consumers really think about GDPR. So, so first and foremost, GDPR is not a US regulation. It does apply to many US companies who are doing business with Euro uh, um, uh, European consumers. So it's not a law that the FTC obviously enforces. Um, from our perspective, um, we have some concerns about GDPR. Um, one of our biggest concerns about GDPR is 
the relationship to the issue of ICANN's Who Is database. So um, this is the, for, do people know about Who Is? So we use Who Is in all of our investigations um, of internet uh, fraudsters and others to, as our starting point for internet investigations. And it, ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, requires its registrars to all uh, maintain this database and it has um, contact information for all domain holders, technical information. And as a result of GDPR, ICANN has suspended those obligations and there's a whole new system that people are thinking about. So we have, we have some concerns that GDPR will have some unintended effects on making information that we think should be publicly available available. Um, but it's hard to know what the average consumer thinks on the consumer trust front, I think there are a number of US companies that have made public pronouncements since GDPR saying we will comply with GDPR. And several of my friends, including um, lawyers at the FTC say, what does that mean? Um, so I, 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 I think though, to the extent that companies are saying we're putting into place certain baseline privacy protections and we're going to make certain commitments about the way we handle your data, I think that will help with consumer trust. But it's, it's, a, it's a different issue in the US. I, I know that the, on May 25th, the day that GDPR went into effect, I, I think I emailed you about this. Um, every, I was getting tons and tons of um, emails, and so was my husband, and we were both working from home that day, and he was just deleting everything. He wasn't reading anything. Yeah, but that's the right thing to do, because. <laughs> Theoretically, they should drop you then. And it's a very, very good uh, opt-out. So uh, I don't know. So it's, but it's, it's complicated. So I, yeah. I, I think the answer to GDPR is, you know, we'll have to see because we'll have to see how. I do think it will have an influence beyond obviously Europe's borders, but exactly what that influence is and exactly how it relates to the overall improvement of consumer trust is something that we'll be, I think, finding out in the next few years. Though, I mean, I mean we've argued that, that the US should have something like the GDPR. I mean, do, do you think that, that at least that has helped with the debate or? You know, um, I have to say that I have been to many, and um, had many conversations and been to many events um, in the last two years, but particularly in the last six months about whether the US should adopt the GDPR. And um, in some ways, I. I I think that that's um, not the right question. Um, I think the question is really what are the baseline privacy protections the U.S. should have. The way the U.S. system is arranged now is we have the Federal Trade Commission Act, which my agency enforces. There are also a lot of sectoral privacy laws. There's COPPA, our Children's Online Privacy Pro Protection Act. There's HIPAA, which deals with health information. There's graham leach Bliley, it's hard to say, that deals with financial information. And so there are laws, but they're um, one, there are a lot of them. And so it's not as simple as the GDPR, where you have sort of a one law. Um, and two, some of them um, have not been updated for a while. So for example, HIPAA, our health privacy law, deals with communications between um, consumers, patients, and their medical providers. It doesn't deal with the kinds of issues that you're dealing with with health data. For example, if you're wearing a fitness tracker. Um, so there are a lot of questions um, out there right now, and there's, I think, what GDPR has done um, coming at the same time as Facebook Cambridge Analytica is it's jump-started that conversation, which has had been a little bit dormant um, about what should come next. So, Johan, I mean, I mean, part, part of I think the, the the aim or the goal of GDPR was also kind of to influence the privacy standard around the world. Um, or, I'm, correct me if that's wrong, but it, and, and, and if that was the goal, did did you achieve that? Hmm. Um, the jury is still out there, I would say, but I think. What, the goal wasn't to impose a European standard globally. I think the goal was to to launch a global debate about how to protect privacy in digital era. And what we've seen is that not only as a result of different revelations of how people's data have been used, but also there have been different debates in different parts of the globe. And there, uh, whether they've been more judicial, etc. I know that 
the the uh, the High Court in India has adopted a recent judgment saying that privacy is also a one of the main values which should be protected under the Indian Constitution. That was a new interpretation of a, a current existing constitution. The same kind of developments we've seen in South Korea, for example. So it's not a European issue, it's not only American issue, it's, it's a global issue and it's tackled in different ways and I think where Europe was a bit of ahead of others was that this debate just started and was ignited here before. Uh, what I see also is that it's a very helpful debate because, I mean, partly we were perhaps, uh, as with the United States, uh, more exposed to the consequences of the, of the digital society before the others, uh, and hence these issues came up for us. Um, but I think it's helpful in order to find the right balance uh, in, in terms of uh, um, what, what do we want from, from, from the digital platforms, what do we want from the interlocutors that have emerged, what kind of role they play vis-à-vis -vis the society as a whole as well as uh, individual consumers. So I don't think that the curse is already set. I think it's something which is dynamic and will move I in the course of time as well. And I will also dispute that GDPR is not a blunt instrument. I mean, I, when, I, when I read it, it's quite future-proof, quite flexible in terms of what it allows, what it doesn't allow. I mean, there are certain principles in place, and I think asking consent and being transparent how your data is used is, I mean, it's not an evil act. <laughs> it is actually, I would say, a common courtesy, I mean, towards your consumer that you do that. And I would also dispute the issue of the icon. I mean, the, the fact that there is nothing new in the GDPR in this sense. It's already in the current directive. Uh, yeah, but the fact I that ICANN has that. been using it is, yeah. is problem, of course. Um, uh, and the only reason they're now interested because we have these... Uh, uh, fines. <laughs> uh, <laughs> fines in place. Um, perhaps it's a good thing that they now paid attention. But... Uh, there's nothing in GDPR that forbids ICANN of doing what it does. It's just a question of how to then be transparent vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, uh, not the users, but the owners of the portals, etc. Um, I would also like to just to clarify one point. I'm not at, on the authentication issue. I'm not advocating abolishing of anonymity in the internet. I, no. I think you have a very good point, Stacey, saying that it's, it's an issue of freedom of expression, free speech, etc. Uh, but uh, there are differences if Google knows that I'm a white 40-year-old male with nine-year-old daughter, or the whole internet knows it. So I think, I mean, what, what I'm advocating is that we look at this interaction of the authenticators and whether what kind of information they receive and how they receive it and whether they have multiple options of authenticating myself or, or, uh, or whether there, there is uh, something that we can do there. Um, on the Back to the cursor issue and the, and the GDPR, again, I mean, for example, now we have uh, another, which we call a sister act of GDPR, it's the privacy regulation on the table. And what the aim of the e-privacy regulation is, is to ensure confidentiality of communication in digital space. So uh, GDPR says, you know, private data should be private unless you give your informed consent that you're okay with using this private data for different purposes. Um, what we look is how to ensure confidentiality. Um, and currently I think there is a problem because we have imposed the confidentiality requirements for the telecom operators. So if you're sending a text, you can be assured, at least in Europe, that the text message is confidential. Nobody can text and data mine your text messages and then, well, even if you know, it's for good purpose of offering you nice services, but they have to ask your consent for it. Uh, even they actually can't do that right now. In the future, we see that if there is a proper consent mechanism, they could offer you services on this basis. But if you're writing a WhatsApp message, that's not in principle confidential because it's outside of the current regime. So we want to change that. And of course, there are a lot of debates around these issues, you know, how to ensure confidentiality, not only of the, of the message, but also the device and the metadata around this message. Some claim that the metadata is not actually confidential. So what is the metadata? It's the location where the message was sent. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sending messages from now, so probably that's not really a confidential information because it's a public event. But if uh, I'm doing it in a different context, it might be problematic for me if I don't know that this kind of information is then used. What some service providers claim is that uh, they can process this data on the basis of legitimate interest, which means that they don't need to ask you every single time whether they can use the metadata or not. That is akin to a kind of a situation in the offline world where you're having a private conversation with your doctor and the manager of the hospital listens in, but you don't know that it listens in. Well, the manager of the hospital might have legitimate interest of listening in because he or she wants to check the quality of the service that the doctor gives you or to see whether they can upgrade something that... But I would prefer that I know that beforehand. Huh? And I would also like to prefer prefer to know how they then will use this information. But the problem, of course, is that they don't want to tell you that because it becomes cumbersome, perhaps, and perhaps you say no. So, I mean, these things we, need, we try to settle with the e-privacy regulation. Um, so, and then we talk about, we talked about transparency vis-a-vis -vis consumers, but also vis-a-vis -vis small and medium-sized enterprises and, and platforms. What are the relationships there? I think there are a lot of issues where we are still looking at where the right place of the cursor is at this moment in time. That doesn't mean that in the future that it would not be moved this or that way. So I see that as a very useful debate. Uh, I mean, GDPR sets certain um, uh, pillars in Europe uh, and it will have effects global effects for the service provider that operate in Europe, obviously. But it's not a debate which is kind of uh, uh, that we have grabbed ourselves. I think the debates in, in the States and also in India and elsewhere uh, will affect uh, the overall outcome in the end of the day as well. On, on, on EU privacy, which is, of course, um, uh, probably even more controversial than, than GDPR, um, I don't know, is it? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I hear. Um, at least I get lobbied a lot yeah. on that. Uh, so, I mean, but, but uh, what Stacy said, so there's a tension, I think, between trust and antitrust. So uh, a lot of, for example, what the GDPR wants, or I think e e privacy even more so, um, uh, probably risks uh, entrenching uh, the dominance of, of certain online firms and makes life more difficult for uh, potential competitors. I, I, just interested in how, how you see that and kind of, uh, I think GDPR makes some allowances for smaller companies, but there's then exceptions, two exceptions. Uh, but are, aren't you worried that in the end, yes, we're protecting uh, consumers' privacy, but we're also protecting uh, Facebook's monopoly? Uh, huh, that's a trick question. I don't think that uh, protecting consumers' privacy means protecting Facebook's monopoly. No, I think privacy by design is something that everybody should acknowledge as a kind of ideal situation where we want to end up with, uh, be you either than a small player or a big player. Um, I think it's not up to us to, to decide what kind of service providers there should exist. I mean, it's in the end of the day, it's a consumer choice. What, what we can do is build a framework in order to make this consumer's choice easy in terms of protecting some of the fundamental values that we have. Because as a consumer, it's probably very difficult for you to negotiate how the service provider that you have become to regard as essential in your life protects your fundamental values. I mean, probably as a, con as a single consumer, I have no influence on, on this uh, service provider. But if the framework is there, uh, probably which will empower the consumer vis-a-vis uh, -vis the service provider, I think then we can talk about um, a much of a better kind of equal relationship. Well, it's never equal, but uh, more equalized, let's say. Um, so that is what we are set out to do in order to create kind of a le more level playing field. And I think uh, privacy by design and security by design, that's another issue that we haven't talked about much. I mean, cybersecurity and how, how to essentially uh, create a more cyber secure environment uh, and raise the general cyber hygiene, not only from the consumer side, but also on the service provider side uh, is essential in this.
Well, thank you. Uh, I would like to open it to questions from the audience, and I I'm, I'm, was quite serious. The first three questions have to be asked by women. Other, okay, over there. Cool. The discussion up for the men. Let me, no, not only for that reason. Uh, let me ask a question to Stacy. Stacy, you said that um, maybe, or you you said that people accept sharing of their data if they expect it, and that makes a lot of sense to me. But you also said that this might kind of resolve the privacy paradox, and I couldn't really understand how that co was connected because it seems that mm, oftentimes people actually don't expect and don't know, uh, and, and, that's, and they give away uh, a lot of data. So it seems that ignorance actually creates trust. Um, and uh, I'm wondering whether, uh, why you think that that kind of uh, helps to resolve the paradox. I just couldn't see the, the connection between the two. Oh, uh, I, I, that's a very good question. I, I wasn't suggesting that, um, that this resolves the privacy paradox as much as it sheds light on the p privacy paradox. So, um, so for example, um, I'm trying to think about the best way to, to, to put this into words. Um, what I what I what I what I was suggesting is that reasonable expectations and consumer trust, like that's that's sort of the connective tissue. But I was also suggesting that an, um, a consumer's reasonable expectations are defined in part by their offline norms, and so these information cascades. Now, as you point out, and I think that this is right, what consumers don't know is part of the equation. And so what they don't know about how data is being collected and shared about them as my agency pointed out in, in our data broker report, for example, um, which talks about lots of the ways that data is shared, bought, sold, reconfigured. Um, that's where um, the biggest privacy harm is likely to come, right? And so, for example, one of the concrete um, examples is, and, and the FTC did this workshop on big data, and it called it a tool for inclusion or exclusion. And it was looking at ways in which um, big data could both help underserved and minority consumers, and in ways in which it could be used against them, um, which is illegal in the United States, for example, under the Fair Credit Act, to make decisions about housing credit, things like that. So it's not so much that it resolves the paradox as much as it explains some consumer behavior. Consumer behavior is based on what they perceive. But the privacy issue is actually much bigger because there are a number of factors that go into you know, modern data privacy that are essentially hidden from the consumer. And consumers don't like the things that are hidden from them. Thank you. Questions? Don't be shy. Hello. Um, I have a question about... Uh, in, sorry? Oh, I had some feed. Oh, the the feedback is a little bit complicated here. Sorry for that. Um, I have a question about the interaction of, of data and competition. Yeah, when you have Amazon company, the Amazon collects all the data yeah, and becomes a monopolist on data, you know, how this affects competition. And this is connected with trust because I think competition is an indirect way for consumers uh, to, yeah, to have trust in the, in the system. Are there any thoughts uh, within the European Commission or the Federal Trade Commission about the connection between the two? And that's my question. Yeah. I can start. Uh, again, I, I can't comment on the individual cases, but you're quite aware of the, uh, some of the cases that the competition enforcement authorities in member states, but also at the European Commission level, have pursued in recent years. I think w one notable one is the Google search, where, of course, you look into issue how data is uh, projected to the consumers, um, 
and I think it is there is a clear link between consumer trust and the way that d data is used. Is it used in a transparent way, or is it uh, used in a way that hides and uh, empowers certain uh, providers vis-à-vis -vis the others? Um, there are other issues or complaints that we've heard, which essentially in the hospitality industry, where some of the platforms. Uh, portray certain search results for the consumers uh, in a way that uh, kind of uh, yeah, compel the consumer to make a very quick choice on uh, on booking uh, either hotel rooms or any other services and whether this is something that is uh, done in a, in, a, in a manner that respects uh, all the consumer not sorry all the competition uh, rules that are in place so I see a connection, and that is also the reason why not, not only at the national level but the European level we are dealing with uh, uh, quite many cases uh, on this area. Perhaps Stacey wants to. Um, well, this is where I get to say how happy I am that I am not a competition lawyer, and um, <laughs> and um, uh, certainly um, my colleagues at the FTC who work on competition issues um, have far more to say about this than I do. Um, what I would say is that uh, you know. Basically, every week I, I, I receive a notice for some sort of international forum where we're going to discuss the intersection between privacy and competition. And so I think as, um, you know, as a starting point, um, obviously um, it is an issue. Um, I, I would say that to date the U.S. approach has been somewhat different from the European approach, although um, in some of our cases and, and merger reviews, going back as far as the Google double-click merger or the um, Facebook um, WhatsApp merger, there have been concerns raised about data as an asset and what role that, that, that plays, for example, in merger review. Um, we at the FTC actually have um, a whole new commission. So our commission is bipartisan, which means that of the five commissioners, three are appointed by the party of the president and two by, um, it can either be the other party or, or independent. And we just have a new complement of commissioners that just came on in, um, in the last month or so. And this is an issue that I know everybody is talking and thinking about. Um, in the U.S. as well as in all of these international conversations. We don't have any enforcement actions to date um, that are based on theories like I, I know the Bundeskartell does have um, an enforcement action based on that theory under German competition law, which I don't really understand German competition law since I don't even understand U.S. competition law, um, but I, I know it, 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 it involves um, a provision that talks about, um, I guess, misuse of data as an unfair term. So that's a, all a long way of saying that um, certainly this is something that we're thinking about. I expect that our commissioners will actually be thinking more about it, um, although I'm not sure that um, at the end of the day, they will wind up necessarily coming to same, the same position, for example, as the Bundeskartell. Yeah, but, but um, on that, I mean, uh, is there another kind of tension between trust and antitrust? So, I mean, once, look, I mean, w w one thing that people oh, yeah. start proposing is, yeah, okay, Google has takeout, but that's or there's data board portability and G GDPR, but that's not uh, fast enough. We need kind of API access. Uh, uh, to the social graph or whatever. So, yes, that's a good idea, kind of. It's, it's the equivalent of what happened with Microsoft and interoperability with server operating systems and all that. Uh, uh, sounds good, but that's exactly what Facebook did uh, with Cambridge Analytica and the other uh, uh, apps. They gave them access to the social graph. And uh, that led to, uh, to that problem. So, so it, but they it, gave the access on their terms, not on the consumer's terms. That, that, that is correct, but I mean, if, the, 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 que the question becomes then, so if, if I, okay, it's like the banking directive, I kind of, yes, you, you other company, you can access my social graph on Facebook, but what is a social graph? It's social, so does that mean uh, my friend's data is also uh, fair game for, because I have given the, um, 
the approval uh, for, for that data to be sucked out. If, I don't, if that's not possible, then of course the whole antitrust uh, uh, or kind of trying to mitigate the, the data power of Facebook doesn't work. So isn't so, there... So, okay, so I, I, am, I actually cannot <laughs> comment on Facebook given our <laughs> pending investigation, but I do want to get to the antitrust and trust um, question that I, I, I think lies at the heart of this. And again, well, I'm not an antitrust lawyer. Um, no, this is, this, is a, this is an issue I think that we see for a long time. One of the big, when you talk about consumer trust, branding, and we haven't really talked about branding yet, branding plays a big role in consumer trust. Consumers are comfortable with brands that they like, that they think reflect their values. In the OECD study I mentioned, um, the OECD Consumer Policy Committee just did, it was really, really interesting to see how much trust consumers put into certain platforms, right? And, and here I'm talking about sharing economy platforms. Um, and so, for example, they put a lot of trust into platforms like Airbnb, right? And even trusting them with, with their data far more than they would trust Facebook with their data. But there's always been a tension between consumer preferences and consumers really trusting a specific brand and I think some of the goals of competition law. And the, the best example I always give of this is that at Dulles International Airport, just outside of Washington, D.C., there is literally a monopoly of taxi cabs. There is one company that is allowed to operate there. They're called Washington Flyer. And I actually love them. They're a little more expensive than if you, you know, just picked up a ra random cab, but they actually are... The drivers always know where they're going. The cabs are always clean. They don't smell bad. And so I see that as like a perfect analogy for the tension here um, between trust and antitrust. Um, and I think that tension that is in my simple taxi cab example, right, extends into the digital economy. And I think it's probably one of the things that maybe, um, you, you know, uh, is could be some of the disconnect about why consumers continue to use certain platforms um, because they like them, right? Even in the face of all the concerns that various policymakers are raising. So when you go back again to, to, to sort of starting with um, consumer trust, it's the experience, it's the relational aspect. This is, you know, many of the platforms are giving consumers something that you know, they trust more because the, either the conventional alternatives don't exist or because they don't like them, because they're not doing a good enough job in meeting their needs. So I, I like this whole idea of this tension, you know, as, as a way of thinking about things, the tension between antitrust and trust, because I think it does shed some light on that whole issue of consumer trust, which is sometimes based on factors that aren't consistent with all of our economic theories and policy concerns. Yeah. You understand? I mean, is that tension debated in that, that sense in, 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 in Brussels, or do you see that tension at all? The tension is there. I, I like the parallels with the offline world always, because, I mean, also from the consumer's perspective, I mean, that's where the consumers get most of their experiences and their perceptions from. So I think it's always also quite useful to draw parallels on how offline world operates and then what is allowed or not allowed in, in the digital space. And I think there, what we find is, for a certain period of time, digital space acted and was perceived as a wild west where some of these principles and the, the, the uh, let's say, the, the balance that we found between trust and antitrust in the offline world did not exist. And now we are re-engaging on all these debates. I also wonder, how the, how the new kind of uh, equilibriums that we are now debating on, uh, for the digital world, how they in turn start to then affect the offline equilibrium that was sometimes placed there hundreds of years ago. Right. So we see this tension very much in the copyright, for example, where you have a lot of restrictions, territoriality, etc., that seem not to be upheld in the digital space. And of course, when you discuss the new copyright environment in the, the digital era, there are a lot of, there are a lot of grounded and well-grounded reasons why you should 
immediately uh, essentially enlarge all these ancient and well-tested principles into digital, but there are also very good reasons why you shouldn't do that. So, um, uh, yeah, the, I think it's a very interesting era that we're living in. So, uh, PDS2 or open banking, and I should say, so, so this is, it's a directive or is it a regulation? Sorry? Uh, PDS2, or the, is it a directive or a regulation? Uh, uh, payment service directive, yeah. yeah, it's a directive. Okay, so the, so the, uh, the idea is that I have a bank account with HSBC or wherever, and uh, if I tell the bank, uh, you have to give access to some fintech company to pull out my transaction data. Uh, they have to do that. And I think they implement, there's a, in, yes, in the UK, well it's the case. Yeah. And um, <coughs> for example, in Chicago at this antitrust conference, that was discussed as one solution uh, for Facebook or, or Google. Uh, could, could, could you imagine that something like that is going to be put into a directive in, in Brussels, kind of dictate uh, uh, access to the social graph of, of Facebook social graph or, or of Google's data, or is that? I mean, it seems to be a good idea for banking. Why not? Why not for? I'm, I'm not dealing with fintech directly, but I mean, uh, that was. It's used as a good example uh, because that allows new service providers to operate in a market that has been historically very heavily regulated for good reasons. I mean, there are uh, anti-money laundering directives in place and, and and rules in order to make sure that we all pay pay taxes and authorities have the ability to then check and trace uh, the, the money flows. But of course that does also mean that, uh, that it's a sector that for a long time has been quite stable in one way and there haven't been new competitors in, in certain markets. So allowing access and mandating data access is something that uh, actually might work and uh, in spring we we just put on the table a new directive on the public service information directive that would look at the ways how we could open up data in sectors that, that are not uh, public per se, but they offer a public service like transport, for example, uh, so that uh, new service providers could use this data in order to uh, essentially provide a bit more competition so can I, uh, can I just comment on that from the consumer trust perspective? So um, just thinking through my hat as a consumer protection lawyer, I would say that in that example that you give with the payment services directive and in the fintech area, consumers really want two things in terms of um, their financial data. They want it to be secure. They don't want it to leak all over the place online. And they want limitations of liability, right? And that, again, as with many of these issues, I think that's where sort of basic consumer protections, right, come in. Um, re re you know, requirements for strong security, whether it's storage requirements, end-to-end um, -end encryption for financial data. Um, and then, as we have in the credit card regime in the United States, where this is often criticized, but where we consumers, you know, essentially have zero liability in case a transaction goes wrong. You can see that if consumers' basic concerns, what they perceive as threats to their finances, um, are taken care of, then they might be more amenable to having their banking data shared with fintech startups. So looking at it from the consumer trust lens is a little bit different, I think, than looking at the overall policy lens, right, about the development of the market. Okay. I mean, exactly on this point, so that is the tension, right? So on the one hand, from competition, uh, from the competition policy perspective, you want to share this data. You want to give access to small companies to this information that can be uh, a barrier to entry in the market. But then from the consumer perspective, then you have the issue of privacy. So maybe as a consumer, you don't want everybody to have access to the data, and then maybe is trust uh, the key. So you have to make clear for the consumers that giving access to their data to other people actually is in, it is in their own interest, and then there are some rules that uh, make sure that this is not misused, right? So, but there is a clear tension there between competition policy and privacy, I see. But I, I would also argue that, I mean, that's why the GDPR is such a great tool, because allowing access now 
will not make a difference in terms of applying the GDPR. You still need to apply the GDPR even if you have access. The consumer still needs to be notified. It has to be on his terms or her terms that this access is then affected in the end of the day. So I wouldn't call it attention, provided that you put trust framework in place. Then you can do a lot of this stuff. The GDPR, it seems to me, does not allow access to the social graph. Because you're if sharing you're sharing information, personal information, other from other people. On basis of your consent, yes, it can be. If if I have a social drive and so, so yeah, my data I can share easily. Yes. But if that data basically comes connected to other people's data, you cannot. Yeah, depends how yeah, you define yeah, the social graph, yeah. yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So uh, there are limits. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, but, but it seems to me that this tension comes to a large extent from the fact that we have bundled together service provision and data management, and that those have become in inextricably linked to each other in the current market structure, but there's not, that doesn't obviously need to be the case. You could have a mar market layer like these data agents, there's a whole bunch of companies that are actually specialized in competing for data management and protection, and in fact, they might well be relatively large organizations that could bundle together large chunks of the social graph or negotiate across them for those social relations. And it seems to me that, that a relationship like that where you could actually separate these things out would actually simultaneously resolve both the trust and the antitrust concerns. So it's really this bundling together of the service layer and the data control and protection layer that is responsible for a lot of uh, these issues. So, and thanks, that, that's a perfect segue to my last question, which is um, blockchain. So, so yes. we've, called, uh, <laughs> we've called the blockchain the, the trust machine. Um, and I won't get into why that is, but I mean, does that come up at all in, 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 in policy debates in Brussels or in, in, in DC as a way of kind of creating trust? I mean, you bake it in, blockchain cannot be changed, at least theoretically. Distributed letters. Yeah, I think, I mean, especially in fintech area, I mean, that we are testing it. I know that there are active discussions in terms of how to apply the, uh, uh, the payment service directive to whether, whether we in the implementing actually could also allow certain usage of, of new technologies provided that they're certified, etc. Yes, it does come up. Uh, I think there's still, it's, it's kind of in a sandbox phase where we are, s we are seeing different member states experimenting with these technologies in different areas, especially in trust services. Um, it's not only in banking, but also in others. Uh, some public authorities do that as well. Uh, I think it's, it's an interesting uh, scheme. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that whether it is still right for us to to put regulatory principles in place. I think it's actually a, a good environment which we have already, which allows to a certain extent to take these new technologies and test them. Um, perhaps the new parliament and the new commission might look into this uh, further. I mean, there are a lot of issues around blockchain and uh, well, the cryptocurrency is one of them and I would I would like to leave that aside, but I think for us, it's what is more important is particularly this trust uh, services that could be perhaps rolled out and used in a way, in much more innovative way, uh, in a digital space that would allow interactions that so far have been very difficult to achieve uh, because all these intermediaries in between. But theoretically, at least, we could just bundle them together and say, "Well, look, guys." We now have a very easy way, a snappy way to, to solve all these problems. So um, I would say that um, blockchain uh, seems you know, very interesting and very promising in certain areas of consumer trust. I think some of the larger policy issues around blockchain and its uses are not ones that my agency would be particularly involved in from the policy um, perspective, uh, although, you know, again, there's always an interagency group on uh, blockchain that, that we'll participate in to try and give our input. Um, the one area, and I guess the way to end this uh, and sort of wrap it up with what I've said um, is from an enforcement perspective, though, you know, anything new under the sun um, is going to have some problems. And 
we actually just brought a case against Bitcoin funding team, which is a cryptocurrency fraud. And unfortunately, one of the things we're seeing emerge in, in the US market, um, although Bitcoin is actually Bitcoin funding team. This is not Bitcoin. This is uh, um, it w actually preyed on consumers in many different countries. But um, you know, for us, consumer trust in, in the market, sometimes you have to go back to basics. And what's particularly interesting to me is that this particular fraud is really just um, sort of an old kind of business opportunity fraud wrapped up in you know, a nice, pretty digital um, package. And a lot of consumers who are otherwise fairly savvy fell for this particular cryptocurrency fraud scheme. So I, I guess I would say that going back to the beginning about consumer trust and consumer trust in the digital economy is that um, you have to pay attention to fundamentals, whether it's basic truth and advertising principles, whether it's basic payment protections, um, whether it's basic requirements for transparency and choice and consent and privacy, or basic protections from online frauds. Um, that all goes into the equation of um, developing consumer trust, and at least from the perspective of my agency, which again is more of a, an enforcement agency than a policy agency, it's making sure that those laws and standards get enforced is a big piece of it, whether it's by an agency like the FTC, whether it's by another federal agency, a state agency, um, classes of consumers, uh, private consumer organizations, it's really important not just to have the policies, um, but to make sure that laws are enforced. Great, thanks Stacy. Good uh, ending word. So thank, <laughs> okay. thanks, thanks a lot. Um, thank you. Yeah, and thanks to the participants. Thank you for a great conversation.